Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The word of the Lord. <laughs> it says, God calls to Avram and Sarai. They're going to be Abraham and Sarah later uh, when they go into the witness protection program. But <laughs> right now, they're Avram and Sarai. And God says to them in the vernacular, get out of Dodge. All right, in Hebrew it says, lech lecha, ma'art secha, in English. It says, lech lecha, get out. It doesn't really mean that, but I'll come back. Most Bibles say, go forth and leave your country, your kin, uh, and your parents' house and go to the place that I will show you. So part of the parable of the whole Bible is that they do actually make a physical journey. But from the mystical perspective, given the grammar, which I will show you in a sec, given the grammar, this is an inner journey. Lech means walk. But lecha, le means toward, cha is yourself. You're making an inner journey toward your truest self, the divine self, the self that's awake in, with, and as, Shekhinah. How do you do that? So the text tells you. You take leave of the narratives that constrain you, that blind you, that fill you with yourself so you can't see those moments when Sabine needs a pin, or a, squirrel, a dead squirrel needs a prayer, or whatever is happening in the moment where you happen to be. So one of the commentaries says, if you look at what God says to them, get out of your country, your kin, and your parents' house, you know it can't mean what we're told it means because it's backwards. If you're going on a journey, the first place you leave is your house, not the last place. Then if you're going far, the next place you leave is your, you know, your community. And the last place you leave is your country. Why is it backwards? So the commentators say it's not in the order of geographic importance, it's in the order of psychological difficulty. The easiest thing to do is to leave your country. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier than the other two. Right? I, can, I mean, I, I tried at one point, almost four years ago, to move to Canada. <laughs> right? I'd gone to school in Canada, I like Canada, I can speak Canadian, eh? And when I lived there and, and I picked up those affectations, no Canadian ever came over to me and said, are you speaking this your first language, eh? No. Lucky for them, they didn't. But the Canadians have a closed border thing. <laughs> they, they don't have a wall, but they don't want anyone south of their border, meaning us, unless you can really give them something they don't have. And they have a lot of babbling rabbis up there. They don't need another one. <laughs> so they weren't going to let me in. <clears throat> but it's easiest to get out of your country. It's more difficult to get out of your culture, your ethnicity. Right? I'm still a Jew. No matter how cosmic I, I have, you know, cos no matter how cosmic moments of my life be, I always come back into being a Jew, right? I put on the yarmulke again, and I'm back. It's very difficult. I'm not saying you should give it up altogether, <clears throat> but you can wear it more lightly. We'll talk about that. So that one's more difficult than your country. But the most difficult thing is the nonsense that your parents taught you as truth that you have to spend years in therapy to unlearn. <laughs> right? I mean, your parents may have been better than my parents, but my parents were screwed up, and they screwed me up. Right? And I had to go to therapy to get unscrewed up. Then I had to find another therapist to unscrew me up from that therapist, <laughs> who was working out his problems with his parents. <laughs> On my dime. <laughs> there may be therapists in here. I'm not talking about you. If you don't take it specifically, what the Bible is saying is, if you want to go to the place that God wants you to get to, it's an inner journey of freeing yourselves from narrative. 
Now again, nobody can be story free, but you can be story light, L-I-T-E. I'm a Jew, but I take it lightly. Right? Someone asked me, at, um, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, I was teaching on campus, and there was one student who was really nervous in my presence, and he had a lot of challenging questions, and he said, what do you do on Shabbat? Because I'm, I'm here on Shabbat. I'm working on Shabbat. I'm using electricity on Shabbat. I, I'm you know, doing all these things. So I, I told him, how can you do this on the Sabbath? And I said, I'm teaching Torah. I'm teaching Torah. Even if I'm teaching Bhagavad Gita, I'm teaching Torah. Even if I'm teaching the Dharmapada, I'm teaching Torah. Even if I'm teaching the Holy Quran, I'm teaching Torah. Even if I'm teaching the Testament, the Tao Te Ching, Chuangzi, I'm teaching Torah. Torah meaning wisdom. That's how I spend my Shabbat. I don't see a problem with it. He did, but that's not my problem. <laughs> So I wear my story, my narratives, lightly. And I know that I'm not only my story. I'm not only my story. Story can be bad, but not always bad. My wife spent 25 years as a preschool teacher. My sister's in her 35th year doing it. And they, they will tell you that if you have a classroom full of three or four-year-olds, they will fight over scarce resources. There's not enough blocks. There's only one truck and three kids want it. There's a, a you know, whatever it is that they're, they're struggling over. And they have to teach the kids to share. But never once in their combined 55 years, uh, or, or 60 years really, of, of teaching, never once did they have a fight in the classroom between a Jewish kid and a Muslim kid because the Muslim kid was Muslim and the Jewish kid was Jewish. They never had a fight. You know, they, they don't fight over those things because they don't know those things yet. But eventually, because I see it all the time, eventually some kid will say to some Jewish kid, some non-Jewish kid will say to some Jewish kid, you killed Christ. And the Jewish kid runs home and says, who's Christ? <laughs> <laughs> Who else knows this? Am I in trouble? <laughs> I mean, people sometimes where I live, because I live in the Bible Belt, some, sometimes people come over saying, you know, you kill Christ. And I say, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> There's no resurrection without crucifixion. <laughs> and why, why does your God want to kill, kill, kill his son anyway? God's all powerful. God's all love. Why couldn't God say, you know, they're really screwed up. Let me fix that. Done. Nope, let me kill my kid. <laughs> now, I've had, I have a kid, I've thought about that. It's not redemptive. <laughs> if I ever did it, I wouldn't say he died for your sins, I'd say he died for mine, maybe, but. But, you know, I've had people say that somebody had to teach them that. Now, there's beautiful things in every religion, and there's ugly things in every religion. I mean, we were just in Israel a couple, about a year and a half ago, and you see how the tension there between Israelis and Palestinians. If you didn't know who was who, and you had, because most Israelis are Sephardic now, they're, they're not European, so they're from Arab countries. So if you took a Sephardic Jew and uh, an Arab uh, Palestinian or Arab Muslim, and, some, and you had to say which one looks, you can't do it. You know, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, that only exists in the fantasy of someone on Madison Avenue who knew it would sell. Jesus is brown. Jesus has kinky hair, right? Jesus was short. He's not the Jesus that we get in, in so many... In, in, Jesus becomes a projection of our own minds. So Jesus looks like us, unless you're a woman, of course. Then no matter what color they do, it doesn't look like you. I have the best crucifix in my office ever. I was in Bethlehem a year and a half or so ago, and they had this, um, you know, I always, we were, we were taking a group, Frank and Susan and I were there, we, we had a group, and uh, we always try to support the local Palestinian economy. So we go to this um, olive wood place, and most of them are schlock, but this was really professional. And they had real artists, named artists, juried, you know, artists who were doing this amazing work, and there was a crucifix, and instead of Jesus hanging on the cross, Mary was on the cross. 
And it was like a pieta. So she's on the cross and she's holding her baby boy, you know, 30 years old, but she's holding Jesus on the cross. I, I, I was blown away by that. I, I so wanted that. And of course, well, we can try to work with you on that. Yes. So, <laughs> and, and I kept saying, no, I can't. It was $900. I said, I don't have that kind of money. Well, we'll take this off. We'll take that off. I said, no, no, you can't make. How much have you got? What can you afford? I said, I got 50 bucks. 50? That's insulting. What are you doing? I said, I'm not trying to buy it. I'm just telling you I can't afford it. But there were two sisters, not sister sisters, but actually biological sisters. And they, they so loved uh, the world that they gave me, you know, uh, the crucifix as a gift. But it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. So you have to wear your stories lightly. To wear your stories lightly. And when you wear your stories lightly, then you can see that there's, like Paul, I love, I love the real Paul. There's three Pauls in the Bible. Marcus Bohr calls them the, the authentic Paul, the faux Paul, and the, and the, and the the radical Paul, the faux Paul, and the anti-Paul. Right? The radical Paul who say, is the guy who says in, in Galatians, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're a true Christian, all these barriers are done. Then you get the faux Paul who says, well, you know, we shouldn't be too open. And then you get the anti-Paul who says, there's definitely male and female in Christ Jesus, and the females are over here, down there. Don't listen to them. They have no power. And because my mother-in-law was, for, for a few minutes, a, a devout uh, Protestant, when she went to church and they told her she couldn't wear pants, she became an atheist. <laughs> she just left the church. She didn't become an atheist. She just became a pant-wearing Christian radical. So Paul says, you know, no, no Jew or Greek, slave or free, right? Male or female. Religion ought to break down walls. It ought to break down barriers, not to create some kind of spiritual Esperanto, but to allow us to see one another as we truly are, unique, precious manifestations of a singular panentheist reality that you can call Allah, God, Yahweh, Brahman, find your, your term mother, even nature. If you're going to be a Lama Dvavnik, you have to strip yourself of these stories. You have to take them lightly. You have to be free from them. If you want to play with them, fine, but don't let them play with you. You know, if I was Mirabai, I would use the F word. <laughs> but I don't, I don't have her guts. <laughs> but don't let them F with you, your stories. If your story makes you angry, if your story makes you uh, cruel, if your story excuses cruelty, if your story excuses violence, then your story is effing with you and you need to let it go. And when you let your story go, or when you take it lightly, then Genesis 12, that's one, then Genesis 12 says at the end, you go into this place that God wants to show you. What it means is you're going to be in a state where God can show you what really exists. God Right? You follow that? It's not that you have to go from place A to place B. God is everywhere and everything, but you're wearing the blinders of a narrative that is just keeping you um, from, from realizing what's true, and then suddenly those are, are, are pulled away, and you see the world the way God sees it. The real God, not the faux God of, of religions that only see what they want, you know, what the... What the power structure says the God can see, but actual God, the God that knows that everything is God, the, the mother that sees everyone as her, ch as her child. 